So now you guys, we want to talk about the treatment. So obviously we want to be very conservative. We don't want to give moms any type of medications if we don't have to. So um, we, uh, with the diagnosis of gestational diabetes, our goal is really to restrict calories and increase exercise. So for the obese patient that is diagnosed, um, they're put on a 1500 kilocalorie a day diet, um, which they are not happy about. But um, this will lower their sugars. Of course, we don't want them on simple uh, sugars or simple carbohydrates. We want them on complex carbohydrates for the carbohydrates they eat. Um, if you're normal weight and you're diagnosed with gestational diabetes, um, it's a 2400 kilocalorie a day diet. Um, standard diabetic diet, 50% um, from carbohydrates. Of course, we send them for uh, dietary counseling. Of course, we recommend exercises. As we know, exercise lowers insulin resistance and, um, you know, burns some of that sugar. So we want that. We want daily blood glucose logs. Um, this really gives us an idea of where they're at and we can keep rather tight controls if we can see it um, one to four times a day depending on the severity of the condition. So, you know, if they are doing okay um, with uh, blood glucose um, once a day, um, of course we're not going to, and their weight gain is fine and the baby's not growing excessively, then we are going to uh, just have them once. But if we have excessive weight gain um, and they're just not as compliant as we'd like, then we're going to have them monitor um, their, law, their blood sugars up to four times a day. So what kind of drugs do we do? So you guys, insulin is the best and it's awesome and it's tight control. However, patients do not like to quote stick themselves. So you guys, um, we have done some investigations and we know that oral hypoglycemic agents are okay. Your book will contradict this, but your book is old um, text. Anytime you read something in a text, that's like 10 years old. So um, we have moved to oral hypoglycemic agents, um, glyburide, which is a sulfonylurea. Um, it acts by increasing insulin resistance, I mean, um, by increasing insulin release, excuse me, from the beta cells in the pancreas. And then, of course, our good old friend Matt Foreman, it's a biguanide, uh, reduces gluconeogenesis in the liver. Um, and then what happens there is you have decreased blood glucose. Insulin, if we have to move to insulin, um, it's usually a two to one ratio um, with MPH and regular, um, you guys, and we just watch. We know that the insulin needs are going to increase during the pregnancy. So once they are on insulin, um, we want to watch them very closely. Um, MPH and regular insulin before breakfast and dinner most is the most common. Um, insulin needs, again, continue to increase. Labor uh, may or may not um, increase the need for insulin. Uh, it depends on how difficult the labor is and how long it is. If it's rather short, you may not have any change. But postpartum, we know that once the placenta is delivered, we know that once the HPL or HCS that the placenta is secreting is delivered, this condition goes away, obviously, if it was only brought on by pregnancy. Of course, if they were a type 2 diabetic prior to pregnancy, we know that... Um, you know, they're going to have to continue whatever regimen they were on before. Um, the biggest focus for gestational diabetes is on nursing education. I mean, I just can't say enough about how sad it is that the media has really hyped up all these big babies um, and it makes other people think that having a big baby is okay when it is definitely not. Um, maternal and fetal outcomes with poor glycemic control, we need to tell them, you know, you it can it hurts you for the duration of your life. Um, it stretches out your ligaments. Um, they'll never be quite the same. And then fetal outcomes, you know, their babies are too big. So a lot of times they have a C-section. If they are not, if they're borderline big, meaning they're around 4,000 grams, but they don't quite make it there. I mean, they can have a shoulder dystocia where their head molds and gets out, but the shoulders get stuck. Um, obviously, you know, the baby gets stuck a million times. And if the baby's blood sugars are really bad, they can't breathe. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. 
dietary teaching, we have to teach them about diet, exercise review, you're not you're not sick, you can exercise, um, explain the medications, how they work, when they take them, why they should take them, and monitoring of glucose. And of course, with education, um, you always want to return demonstration. That that really is the highest level of education to see that they can do it. So what is the prenatal care? Prenatal care is, um, here, let me pull this out for you guys so you can see it a little bit better. I'm sorry about that. It's not Let's see. Okay, that's better. Um, prenatal care is every two weeks until the third trimester, and we know um, that that high sugars damage the vasculature. So we do weekly non-stress tests on these patients just to make sure that the placenta is not being damaged by these high sugars. Um, very often it is, and so that's a very uh, it can be a poor outcome for the baby. So this is why we do routine non-stress tests every week, just to make sure that we don't have utero placental insufficiency. Early delivery of infants due to big size and increased incidence of, of intrauterine fetal death. Um, you guys, one of the biggest things is the higher the maternal sugar, it's going to cross over the placenta and then the baby is going to have higher insulin levels. So unfortunately, the higher the baby's insulin levels, the decreased amount of surfactant is made for the lungs. It changes the proteins and it, it damages one of the arms of the protein. And so you guys, we have a decreased lung function. This is why these gigantic babies go to the NICU is because they can't breathe. So if we do a delivery um, prior to 40 weeks, we're going to check a lethicin to spenthomyelin ratio, and that's just a ratio for lung maturity. Um, if they don't have mature lungs, guess what? We're not going to deliver them because that's just a trip to the NICU and another complication that can happen. We'll let them stay in utero unless the placenta goes bad. When they're delivered, you guys, so again, the babies are used to very high sugars. Um, they get um, placental hyperplasia and so their little, I'm not placental, I'm sorry, pancreatic hyperplasia. It's the babies, because they are so used to mom's super high blood sugars. They get pancreatic hyperplasia and so they produce way too much insulin. So you guys, when the baby is born, um, obviously it is cut away from that glucose source. The baby has far too much insulin on board. The baby also goes through fight or flight, which makes the baby burn their available glucose very rapidly. So a lot of these babies are hypoglycemic when they come out. Um, again, maternal glucose crosses the placenta and maternal insulin does not. You'll have a baby with super high insulin and dropping glucose, which is really technically hyperinsulinemia, but the manifestations are hypoglycemia. So DKA in pregnancy, um, you know, there's risk for diabetic ketoacidosis, neurological sequela as a, re as a result of ketosis. Um, moms uh, or babies uh, can die. 90% of babies die when moms go into ketoacidosis and moms 5 to 15%. So you guys um, just know that having a, a big baby is always a bad thing. The biggest things that are that can happen to the baby is we can have damage on the way out, um, shoulder dystocia, bruising, broken clavicle. Um, we The sad thing is, is if mom's blood sugars are really high, the baby doesn't have enough surfactant, may have to go to the NICU, um, may have to get oxygen. Some I've seen some babies intubated. They have to get ABGs. They have to get CBCs. They have to get antibiotics from all this sticking and just all these things. So it's really sad. Um, these are things that we can prevent, and we just have to do a lot of education. Thank you.